Hi, this is Mallory Nye, and welcome back to the Histories Inc. podcast series. This is episode three, in which I'll continue with my introduction to the main themes of the podcast series. In fact, I'm going to do something different in this case. As I was preparing this episode, I gradually came to the conclusion that I've got a lot of material that I want to get through at this stage. The topic overlaps in many different ways with the other themes of the podcast, but even so, there is a lot to say. So this particular podcast comes in two parts, episodes three and four of the series, which makes the topic a little bit more manageable in size. This means I will be cutting the discussion somewhere in the middle and asking you to move from this episode to episode four to hear the continuation of that discussion. I hope you don't mind the break, and I'll let you know when we get to the end, of course. So, what were the Protestant Reformations, and why did they matter? The 16th century not only saw the transformations resulting from the colonial exploitations of the New World, it was also a time when much of Europe became embroiled in the social, political and ecclesiastical changes that we now call the Reformation. In the simple version of history, the story goes that the universal Catholic Church had grown degenerate and beyond reform, so groups of reformers agitated for, and eventually delivered, new Christian religious organisations that are now broadly seen as Protestant. These ranged from the English Protestantism of the Anglican Church, which retained bishops along with numerous other idolatrous practices and beliefs, such as the Mass, confession to a priest, sacraments, and so on. And in other places across continental Europe, there was Lutherism and Calvinism and their derivatives, for example in Scotland, Holland, Germany, and North America. All these emerged out of the activism that took place from the early 1400s through to the end of the 1500s, and which have continued to develop in subsequent centuries. Throughout much of this, the assumption is that Catholicism needed to change, and it didn't change quickly enough, either in terms of its structures and theology, and also in terms of its political role within the societies of Europe. Indeed, there had been long-standing pressures for change within the religious and church groups that are now labelled as medieval Catholicism. Some of this had occurred within the upper hierarchy of the church itself, not least the division of the papacy and final reunification in the 14th and early 15th centuries, from 1378 to 1417, that is, with the conflict between the Avignon and the Roman popes. There were also the various social, cultural and religious movements that gave rise to new social formations and pressure groups, such as the crusading movements from 1096 onwards, and the rise of new mendicant religious orders based on an active engagement with communities, such as the Franciscans and the Dominicans. The Dominicans themselves had emerged from religious descent, a form of reformation in the 13th century, in response to the rise of the Cathar movement. The Cathars' support came largely from their anti-materialism, the idea that spirituality was opposed to worldliness and material satisfaction. This was a direct criticism of the Church of the day, which was very largely associated with material wealth. The mendicant orders of Dominicans and Franciscans did an effective job of turning this on its head for a while, since they also preached an otherworldly anti-materialism similar to the Cathars, but remaining within the established theology of the Church. However, over the centuries this asceticism had radically declined, and the mendicant orders were associated with material comfort by the time of the reformations of the 16th century. There were further reforming movements as early as the 14th century, most notably perhaps the Lollards of England, stemming from the Oxford scholar John Wycliffe. These worked largely underground for reforms in the church, including vernacular translations and a more spiritual and less worldly church. Reformers of the 16th century indicated their continuation of the Lollard traditions with, for example, one Catholic observer, Henry VIII's Bishop of Durham, Cuthbert Tunstall, describing Lutheranism as the foster child of the Wycliffite heresy, that is, Lollardism. A somewhat similar movement developed in Eastern Europe, 
following the execution by the church of the Czech reformer Jan Hus in 1415. Unlike the Lollards, however, the Hussites, as they became known, gained a political base in the Kingdom of Bohemia, which thus openly challenged the dominance of the Catholic Church, and indeed for much of the 15th century. As with the Lollards, the Hussites, and more general Bohemian Reformed Christians, criticised the wealth of the churches. They sought the translation of scriptures into the vernacular, and sought new understandings of the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist. Indeed, there was an even earlier reforming group that emerged in the 12th century, around 1170, now known as the Waldensians, which were largely based around Lyon and the French Alps. Thus, in many respects, the Reformation, when it happened in the early 1500s, was not as new or radical as we now think it to have been. What was radical was the way in which it changed the political complexion of Europe, and in particular how the power base of the Catholic Church was drastically reduced, and indeed transformed. The Church had already had to live with a measure of religious pluralism within its sphere of influence, inasmuch as Bohemia had established itself as a distinct political entity from Rome, and the rival popes of Avignon and Rome had created a sense of diverse affiliations across the Western continent. But what happened is that the diversity erupted across nearly every Catholic state, and in some cases allegiance to the Church and Catholic hegemony were lost altogether. The Protestant Reformation, or more correctly perhaps, the various reformations that happened across Europe in the 16th century, is largely held to have begun with the decision by Martin Luther to publicly state his opposition to certain aspects of a combination of theology and business on the part of the Catholic Church hierarchy. In 1517 he nailed his thesis on reform to the door of a church in Wittenberg, and subsequently went on to have a prolific career of dissent against the church, in print and through preaching, that encouraged other reformers to also raise their concerns. Within decades, reformers, soon labelled as Protestants, were actively organising through prayer and study meetings, through publishing and through use of new vernacular translations of the Bible, challenging the prevailing orthodoxy of the Rome-centred church. In doing so, Europe became divided in many ways, eventually establishing some countries as firmly Protestant or firmly Catholic, whilst in others tensions between these two factions simmered away for centuries. My own interest in the Reformations came as a result of an initial interest in the history of the city of Perth in Scotland where I live. This inevitably led me in particular to the events in Perth in May 1559. Again, the story here in Perth starts out as quite simple. The Calvinist Scot John Knox, who had recently returned from exile in John Calvin's Geneva, preached against idolatry in the local parish church of St John's, and following this the people of Perth, together with several hundred others, the Scottish Protestant congregation, went on a rampage around the city, destroying four ancient monasteries. The actions of this rascal multitude were not necessarily what Knox had wished for. It appears that he preferred the less radical model of what had happened more recently in the nearby city of Dundee, where the Catholic priests had been ousted more peacefully from the main churches and had been replaced by Protestant liturgy and preachers. But the end result of the Perth riot and destruction of the religious houses was that the Scottish Reformation was set on fire. In Scotland, so history tells us, the Reformation was in part about religious change, but it was also about the need for Scotland to retain its independence, in the face of considerable political and military interference from both England and France. In 1559, Scotland was ruled by a French Queen Regent, Mary of Guise, who held power on behalf of her young daughter, also called Mary, who was then only 16 years old and living in France. This younger Mary eventually returned to Scotland, to become the famous or infamous Mary Queen of Scots. In her absence, though, and through the regency of her mother, Scotland was remaining strongly Catholic, 
and Catholic with a distinctly French influence. In contrast, Scotland at the time was also heavily influenced by English political pressure. Just over a decade before, the English King Henry VIII had dispatched a number of military invasions into Scotland, with the aim of forcing a marriage between his young son Edward and the infant Queen Mary, Queen of Scots. The aim of Henry had been a political merger of England and Scotland, through the marriage and the issue of these two royals. As it happened, that monarchic merger came about a generation later, after Mary married a relative of King Henry, through his sister Margaret, and their son became King James the Sixth of Scotland and King James the I of England, thus unifying the two crowns. A century later, in 1707, the two kingdoms themselves were merged in the Act of Union that created the United Kingdom of Great Britain. If the French influence on Scotland in 1559 was profoundly Catholic, the influence from England reflected the political fortunes of whoever had the upper hand within the English Reformation at that time. Henry VIII had created the Protestant Church of England, and it was this that he intended to pass to his successor, Edward VI, who did indeed become king in 1547. However, Edward died soon after, in 53, and his older sister, another Mary, the daughter of the Spaniard Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife, this Mary reinstated Catholicism during her rule, which earned her the historical epithet of Bloody Mary, due to the Protestants she executed. However, Bloody Mary herself failed to maintain a secure position, and died in 1558, leaving way for her sister, the Protestant Elizabeth, to become queen, and reinstate the Church of England, thus making England a powerful Protestant nation again, in opposition to French Catholicism. It's quite likely that if Henry had had greater military and political success in the 1540s, then the Reformation would have happened in Scotland at that time, and not in 1559, and Scotland would then have had a broadly Anglican church imposed on it from England. As it happened, though, England did support the Scottish Reformation when it did occur at the end of the 50s, but only from a distance, as Elizabeth was reluctant during her early days of power to go into direct conflict with France. Thus Scotland achieved a Scottish Reformation that established Calvinism far more centrally in Scotland than it ever managed to achieve in England. As the famous stories go, in England, the Calvinists, or at least some of them, went off as pilgrims to the New World instead, establishing settlements such as the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Plymouth and Rhode Island, and thus eventually helping to establish the United States of America. Perth, in May 1559, was the tipping point of Scottish Protestantism. It was the heart of a rebellion that not only displaced the French Catholic Mary of Guise from power, but also started the small-scale civil war that a year later consolidated Protestant Christianity as the religion of Scotland and effectively outlawed Catholic practices. The process of Scottish culture becoming majority Protestant was a much longer story, which required a gritty determinism to retain its distinction from English Protestantism, together with the organisation, education and zeal that were hallmarks of the Calvinist Protestant movement. But my central question is not how the Reformation happened in Scotland and elsewhere, but why. It didn't happen in Ireland, despite considerable efforts by Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And of course, France and Spain also resisted the changes. France lived with the tensions of the Protestant Huguenots for a long time, Indeed, it was Huguenots who initially attempted to settle in the New World, in Florida, in the 1560s, and further American settlement in New France, that is Quebec, also held such Protestant involvement. Spain was quite different, however, in that it remained loyally, one could say brutally, Catholic throughout this time of Reformation. A significant factor here was the emergence of Spain and Portugal from the long struggle for Christian dominance in the Iberian Peninsula against the Muslim Moors. Once this was finally achieved in 1492, 
the need to ensure homogeneity against crypto and secret Jewish and Muslim influences also helped to flush out any potential for Christian religious dissent. It was Spain in particular that saw the influence of the Inquisition that moved from purging Islam and Judaism to purging Protestantism. A further factor for Spain was that all this played out against the backdrop of the emergence of Spanish economic and military power on the basis of the newfound wealth in the New World of America, the West Indies and New Spain. So, I'm going to have a brief pause here, as this episode has gradually become longer and longer as I've been planning it, as I said at the beginning. If you want to hear the rest of the discussion of this introduction to the issues of Reformation, then please go straight on to listen to episode 4. I'll see you there.